One, two, three. Hello and welcome back to the Mixed Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK. And unfortunately, Lou is not here for with me on this episode. Um, Lou had some personal stuff that he had to go take care of. Um, yeah, he's all good. He's all good. And we're going to talk today about something so fun. As, as always, as we've been, not as always, this is something new that we've been trying to do. Right now, I am live on Twitch. The moment that I'm recording this, Monday, 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, I start going live. For the first 30 minutes, we just chat and talk about potential episode ideas and answer some questions. Right now, I'm live on Twitch. And if you would like to participate in the recording of these podcast episodes, come join us on Twitch. You can find the link to Twitch via mixingmusicpodcast.com or you can go directly via twitch.tv backslash dkmixes. All right, let's get on with the episode. Today's a fun one. I know everybody wants me to talk about technical tips and tricks. Today is one of those episodes. We're going to talk about vocal compression, specifically for vocals, because I love vocals. I think vocals are unanimously agreed upon to be one of the most important parts of any sort of song or mix. Um, Well, usually, typically, unless you're doing like sample vocal chops and stuff, whatever, right? But anyway, vocals are very, very important. And let's talk about... So a few different topics here, why we compress vocals, um, what I personally look for in compressors, and what type of compressors, what am I using recently? So let's talk about why we compress vocals. Why do we compress vocals? Well, first off, um, the, the idea of compressors, there used to be a job. This was an entire job done by an engineer here where, for example, back in the day before outboard compressors were any sort of a real thing, um, there was a dude that would play the board, the console, and he he or she would anticipate the vocalist and and read kind of read the dynamics and would push the fader up or down based on how much that they're gonna belt or yell versus how quiet they're gonna sing. So trying to keep the vocals in a relatively normal level. So that was that was a job before. Then as soon as the compressor was created, uh, that person got fired. I know that, for example, um, the Fairchild 660 was invented, and was commissioned by, if I'm not mistaken, Les Paul. I forgot the dude's name that made it. But that was one of the first compressors, right? Compressor limiters. And um, so at first it was very pragmatic, and, and it still is, right? The point of the compressor is to limit the dynamic range of whatever's being used on. It's acting in place of the person turning up the volume or turning down the volume to kind of make it... So the worst thing that you can do, and and we hear this all the time in various different audio formats. Maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's a music. We hear this a lot in like jazz or classical music where there's basically no compression, where um, you have to turn up the speakers when it gets to the quiet parts and turn it down again when it gets to the loud parts. And we, we want to prevent like there's actual, for example, in within the realm of podcasts, there's actual technical data that shows that if an, if a listener has to turn up and down the volume. So for example, if the guest is significantly quieter than the, the, the host or the, the volume changes fluctuates crazy during the episode, um, People are likely to click away, are are whatever, I forgot the exact percent, like 60% of people click away or leave the podcast episode if they have to change the volume more than once or twice. Some crazy high statistic. People just don't like that. So it's it's kind of pragmatic. It's to kind of minimize the dynamic difference between the quiet parts and the loud parts so we can enjoy the music. Um and and to preserve the emotions of the quiet bits and the loud bits without losing without losing the actual, uh, especially because it has to go through transducers with speakers, like without actually losing the effectiveness of the speakers, of the transducers. So compression is really, really dope, and, and it's a great way we don't have to, it was one of the first ways that the recording industry uh, initiated uh, robots to do the human's work and fired all the humans <laughs> to do one simple specific task. So <laughs> um, we'll see a lot more of that happening in the next few decades. But anyway, uh, um, so that's what compressors are. Uh, and we've discovered that through different electronic pieces with different FET tubes, uh, devices, opto cells, there's many different devices that now change the tone circuitry. Like, uh, this is more electronic engineering. I'm not familiar with as much of, so I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert, 
but electrical engineering, there's there's bits and pieces. There's pieces within the the signal path of each compressor that tonally changes the sound. Uh, some common descriptions of compressors is usually some sort of uh, high end sheen or warmth by cutting off some of the upper mid range stuff. Um, and top end or a low mid bump, a low bump. That's a pretty common to hear with compression as well, especially within two type compressions. There's, there's very 1176s are more known for their aggressive mid range, which I really, really like the purple 1176 on plugin Alliance is one of my favorites. Cause it has this really nice aggressive mid range, the Fairchild 670, the, the OG legacy version uh, from UAD is to die for. It is so great mid-range for the vocals. It just does this mid-range magic. Uh, Leslie Brathway talks a lot about it and does that a lot. Fairchild 670 Legacy from UAD, really great plugin, and it's free if you own any um, UAD products. Anyway, so compression, there is a pragmatic side of it. It solves an issue. It, it lessens the dynamic difference, right? The dynamic range in a, in a performance, in a electrical signal, in the sound. All right, now there's also a tonal thing. We, we A lot of people use compressors to change the tone or to enhance the tone of a vocal. I myself like there, and there's very many, very different types of compressors. Now, I think I talk about compressors in a previous, in one of the very first early episodes of the podcast, but I'll briefly go over it right now. There are a, usually there's a few different aspects within a compressor. There is a ratio. There is input and output, there is a threshold, there is attack and release. Um, and oftentimes you'll also see a mix mix knob, a dry and wet mix knob. Very briefly, I'm just going to go over that. The input obviously goes, increases or lowers the input signal of the selected sound source. Output, same thing. Um, oftentimes we'll see with, and then there's threshold. Threshold is the set level, sometimes, for example, 1176 is a set threshold compressor. That means that all you have to, in order for to compress more, you have to turn up the input. Where some compressors, for example, our comp from Waves or your default compressor, you can change the threshold so you don't actually have to turn up the input signal in order to compress more signal if you want to do that. Um, so uh, there's that as well. Threshold is very, very important to think about. Um, and that's, that's an, the threshold is whenever any sort of volume passes that threshold, that's when the compressor starts working. And the ratio, which is really important, typically speaking, the ratio, for example, two to one ratio means that two dBs, the, uh, if for every two dBs that goes past the threshold, one dB comes out. So it squeezes it about 50%. Does that make sense? So if you're compressing, if you're 10 dBs above the threshold, then the compressor should be compressing 5 dBs. So if you're 10 to 1, that means for every 10 dBs of, uh, uh, 10 dBs, past the threshold, the compressor is only letting out one dB of volume out. So it's compressing a lot more and it's a lot harder curve. There's usually, so oftentimes you'll see what's called a knee um, on some of these compressors, a more modern digital compressor, you'll see a knee. A knee is the curve. So it's there's a visual aspect to it. And you can see it in a lot of your stock compressors where it's like a line and all of a sudden it curves. And if the higher the ratio is, the curve is steeper, goes flat. It, it kind of it's supposed to represent the volume and the dynamics there. It's hard to explain in audio only. Um, but the point is a knee kind of slowly introduces the compressor rather than hits it harder. So it's a slow entryway ramp into the compression rather than a sudden compression, sudden threshold. So, yeah. And then, so there are various types of compressors as well. So various types of compressors, we have opto compressors, we have FET compressors, we have very mu compressors. Now, these are the three main ones. Um, and then we can go also go into VCA, uh, diode, uh, what is it called? Is it diode? Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm not saying the right one. I apologize. But within the whole compressor world, there's so many different tones. There's so many different sounds. And I want to talk a little bit about, um, each of these tones and what I like to use, especially for vocals. Now, oftentimes there's three main compressors that you'll see me using on vocals of various types, whether it's for lead, background, crowds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to first talk about, so how I usually do this, and this is very much Leslie Brathwaite influence with a little, with a little bit of DK. So I usually do DSing first. I believe in taking things away before adding, uh, 
that's not correct or is the practical way to do it. Uh, it's not, it's not, there, this is, there's no set way to do this. This is just a personal preference, but I personally, this comes from Leslie, uh, DSing first. I put that first in the chain and then I do some sort of subtractive EQ, usually with the Fab Filter Pro Q3, uh, if you know what that is. And uh, then I go into, recently I've been using a lot of a plugin called Magic Death Eye. It's a very mute type compression. It's got a really cool tone. First off, it's very smooth. It reduces the dynamics in a very pleasant way. And it adds a lot of, it's got this low mid bump and high upper mid, um, upper mid like dip. And it's got this, it's got this really cool, it makes things that are slightly less harsh and it really warms it up. It's really, really great. It's really warm. I love it. It sounds great. The saturation on it is beautiful and it's got a lot of different settings. It's, it's Fairchild-esque, but it's not Fairchild. It's, it's a little bit different than a Fairchild tone. It's very, very dope. Um, and I use the mono plugin version for that. Um, these are all plugins, by the way. I'm I'm mostly in the box. I do. I'll talk about my outboard compressor that I like to use on vocals quite often, um, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, then I usually do some sort of saturation, some tonal shaping from there. Uh, at the end of the chain, after I do a more additive EQ and some different things, which this is not what that episode's about. I could talk about it on a different time. Uh, but towards the end, I'll do one other final compressor, which is usually the 1176, the Purple Audio 1176, um, Purple 77, uh, MC 77, I believe it's called on uh, Plugin Alliance. Really, really great. First off, that specific 1176 is for some reason really aggressive. It's I love the tone. Like it, the meter shows that you're only doing minus two dBs of gain reduction, but it feels like it's doing a lot more. It really pushes the mid range aggressively. I love it. I love it. I love it. And and I love how it changes the dynamics, how it reduces the dynamics. I think it's beautiful. Another uh, another option that I used to use a lot more and I use here and there oftentimes is classic Leslie Brathwaite ta- loves the original, like I said before, the original uh, 670 by Fair Ch- UAT Fairchild Legacy version. And, and that sounds really great. I love the mid-range on it. Tonally, I think it can change a vocal and make it sound really wonderful. Another one that I personally use a lot is this is if you want to, if you have to get outboard gear, if you live for outboard gear, which is really cool, the one that I own that I use that I say is worth going out of the box for that won't break your bank is the Golden Age Comp 2A. I don't give a crap that it's a budget-style clone compressor. I have shot it out with vintage CLA uh, LA 2As, and I've shot it out with other LA 2As, and it is it it really holds itself well. In fact, I preferred it, and other people have preferred it more than the actual LA 2A in, in a few instances. So it's beautiful, beautiful LA 2A clone by Golden Age, I use that when I have a really harsh vocal and no matter what I'm doing, it's really hard to explain. This is something that comes with time. Um, but if I just can't get that digital harshness out, no matter what I do, I run it through that thing. It does this upper mid range dip and top eight top end shine. It really smooths out that mid range and up top end. And it adds this low end that is just so gorgeous. And, Oh, it just makes it feel really, really warm. I think that is one of the only few pieces that is worth going out of the box for. And I would say, and that's, for me, that's saying a lot because I hate going out of the box. Like, it takes a lot for me to go out of the box because of all the, this is not worth it. It just takes too much time. It takes too much hassle. Recall, blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't want to print things. I only have one and I can only use one in every session. So it's like, unless I, again, I commit to it or whatever. It's just not worth it. I'm, I try to stay mostly in the box. And it's just one of those that's just phenomenal. And that's an opto compressor. So that's LA-2A is typically an opto type compressor. There's an opto cell, so it uses light, a light signal. It's very interesting. You can read more about this. I actually have a free PDF about all of these compressors and how I like to use them and which ones I recommend purchasing or trying in plug-in format. This is actually a really great segue into... In dkmixes.com, there's a tab that says source resources or free stuff. Sorry, free stuff. Free stuff. So dkmixes.com, free stuff. You can also find it on mixymusicpodcast.com in the tab free stuff. Or you can go directly to store.dkmixes.com. Go to the free stuff tab. There's a PDF that I made that goes over all the different types of compressors, how I use them. And I highly recommend downloading this PDF because I go into very big detail, uh, very detailed 
information about what I like to use it for, what it typically sounds like, uh, what other people have used, my recommendations on plugins that do a good job do, doing that sound. Uh, really, really great. Um, I think that also in the compressor world, uh, vocals, I think oftentimes people compress too much. I see that a bit. Um, you do want to do a combination of automating and compressing. Now, this is here and there. I think that I find a lot of high-level pros doing enough compression where they get a lot of volume out, but not squashing too much. Um, and then they make up for the differences with automation. Now, typically, I like to automate with clip gain first, and then I automate vocals with with the volume, the actual volume. But uh, automation and compression together will give you the smoothest tone. At the beginning stages, it's really hard to tell when a vocal is overcompressed. Sometimes it's really obvious when they've really overdone it. Um, but you can overcompress a vocal, and I, I will say be wary about that, especially the more minimalistic the genre or the music is. For example, if you do folk or singer-songwriter or classical or jazz, you can very easily overcompress. So just be aware of how it sounds. Listen and always bypass your plugins or your gear, whatever it is, always bypass and double check to make sure that it's actually helping. Um, but yeah, compressors, I use them a lot. Honestly, I use compressors more for the tone and for the saturation that it adds than the actual compression. Like the compression is dope and I, and I am aware of what's going on. It's not, it's not something that I'm, I'm just forgetting about, not paying attention to. But I am more paying attention and I pick my compressors based off of tone for sure. Um, there are a lot of other really, really great options out there. Um, but typically, um, those are some of my favorite compressors. Now, I don't really know what else to say about compressing vocals. This is going to be a short episode. I think it's it's too late to say that now. But hello, this is a, this is a short episode. Um, but as far as other compressors and other type of techniques, I often also recommend... Oh, I, I, forgot, I forgot to mention, I brought it up, but I didn't even talk about it, is the mix dry wet knob. Sometimes on these compressors, especially in plug-in format, you'll find a dry wet knob or a mix knob, and this is very useful, um, especially for vocals. Uh, this is something that's called parallel processing. That means uh, Andrew Sheps, a famous engineer, is obsessed with parallel processing, and everything that he does is parallel processed. So uh, I think that it's good to talk about this. It's it's very cool technique here. What you do is you use a send or duplicate a track, let's say of the vocal, right? And you you leave the main one untouched, and the secondary one you hyper compress it, over compress it, overdo it, and then you turn up the, you turn up the volume from zero, so it's it's muted or it's very low. And obviously, you can solo it out to kind of hear the over compression, make sure that it's doing it right. And then you can blend it in with the main signal, turning it up and blending it in with the main signal. So you're adding that hyper compressed sound and blending it with the non compressed sound. So that's uh, more of like I'm going to call it uh, uh, bottom up compression versus top down. So compressors usually, once they pass the level passes a threshold, it'll turn it down. So it takes down the peaks. We're looking at these sounds, these waveforms look like mountains, right? So taking down the transients, the peaks, and lowering the volume for those moments. Now, bottom up compression, MV2 from Waves does this as well. There's a few compressors that do this by itself, but this is the main reason why we parallel compress is because when you introduce that hypercompressed signal, you're mostly, you're not really low Lowering the transients, the peaks, you're not lowering them at all. In fact, you're only reintroducing the low level information. So it's compressing and, and uh, compressing the dynamic range of a track or a vocal, but you're bringing up the quiet stuff, right? So that's, that's very, very important. It does sound different and it is, in my experience, feels a little bit more natural. And so I, that's something that I do often as well. Uh, I, that's when I use, uh, recently I've been using the Fairchild 670 UAD version, legacy UAD version, um, as my parallel. I'll crush the vocal with that because I love the mid-range that it adds as well. And then I introduce it a little bit into the lead vocal, and that way I can have a much more even dynamic range of a vocal without destroying the transients and the peaks of consonants and different sounds that the the lips and the mouth and the teeth and the what they all make. So um, 
I think that that sounds amazing. And with the mix wet dry knob on these plugins is a way to do that in a single plugin. So instead of duplicating the track or doing a send and, and figuring that out, a pre-fader send, um, though you can do that directly in the plugin. So for example, 100% wet means that it's 100% the compressed signal, the process signal. 100% dry is is it's just it's not even going through the plugin. It's just signal in, signal out, clean. So if you do 70% wet, that means 30% of the signal is the uncompressed signal. It's the original dry signal. And oftentimes I like to do this in vocals, this is this is for everything. Mix bus, drums, everything. I do parallel compression for a lot of different things. I don't overdo it because Andrew Shep's parallels and parallels and parallels and parallels that and then parallels that. Like his his stuff is just really crazy. Um, but I do think that uh there is there is a secret there with some sort of parallel compression and trying to uh raise the lower volume information rather than bringing down the top. It does have a different tone, has a different vibe. I really recommend you try it and seeing if that works out for you. Now, it is not an end-all, and I think that one habit that everybody has is they don't listen for compression. Now, when you compress something, you should never, ever, ever compress a vocal just because you're told to, just because you're supposed to. You should freaking listen. Use your ears. We all listen to music. It doesn't matter how advanced we are in our professional, in, in the field of recording. In the recording arts, it doesn't matter if you're really professional or if you're just starting brand new to this. Don't use a compressor just because you're told to. Compression is very, very important and it can be extremely helpful, but it is important, more important to listen and to do it on purpose. That is incredibly important. So when you compress, listen. The art of listening is so important and do not be afraid. Be brave and do not be afraid to say, hey, I don't think this is working. If you ever watch me mix live, so I mix live on Thursday mornings, 10 a.m. I do a little bit of live mixing for a couple hours. And when that happens, you'll see me bypass plugins and then you'll see me change my mind quite often. I'll be like, ah, that didn't work. That is normal. You do it. Everybody does that listen, use your ears. You have, you listen to music for fun. You wouldn't be making music if you didn't listen to music for fun. So you, everybody already has a decent ear. Just listen. Um, compression is really hard to hear. So if you are in the early, early stages and to the point where you may not quite understand half the things that I'm talking about, that's okay. Uh, look into it, go on YouTube, Google search things, all the various things. I will say, it's really, really hard to hear compression, especially in vocals in the early stages. I will say that. Um, it is not... And, and to be honest, the tonal differences that I'm talking about are a lot more subtle than I'm, I'm leading it on to be. They are very subtle. And they, they don't necessarily make or break, but they do to me because my ears are more trained and sensitive. So it's, it's you know, like... Uh, it's don't, don't fret too much about it. Just do it on purpose. And if you are, one great practice to try is to, at first, if you're especially in the early stages of your career, like over compress just to hear what the compressor sounds like and hear what it's doing to go crazy with it. Like go however much, like the max that you can do on that compressor and hear how it's sucking and punching and pushing and pulling, all that jazz, all the all the words that you can describe, the characteristics of compression, and then back it off. And I would say, you should back it off to the point where you can't hear it anymore. I think that's a good place to leave a compressor. Back it off to the point where you can't hear it anymore. Uh, especially in the early stages, early to intermediate stages, if you like compress it to the point where you can hear it and then back it off to the point where you can't. And I think that that's a great baseline foundational help. Um, never in any point should you, is it realistic? Mm, no. Uh, let me Let me say this better because it is creative, and, and I don't think that there should be a rule for this. But very rarely will you ever compress more than 5 to 10 dBs on a vocal on purpose. Very rarely. Now, now that being said, 5 to 10 dBs the entire time. So, for example, and, and I, I say that range because I think that going 5 dBs consistently is fine. Especially you'll find on some various different plugins. Some plugins, it's just no matter how much you compress, it doesn't feel like it's compressing very much, which is a great, great compressor if you can get that sound. But um, some compressors, like you just, for example, the MC77, the 1176 from Purple Audio on Plugin Alliance, like one to two dBs is more than enough because you can really hear it and it feels, sounds great. And it's compressing. It feels like it's compressing a lot more than it's reading. But um, 
So just be aware. So that being said, uh, you do want to not over compress. You want to be careful. And it, and in general, one of the keys to this is if you do want to compress a lot more for the pragmatic reason to solve the issue of dynamic range, if you want to solve the issue of dynamic range, I think you should compress and then from there automate and then or uh, instead of but not doing too much compression at once, you want to do split up the compression potentially. Uh, obviously, some compressors sound better when you compress a lot, um, but I would recommend doing a little bit of compression in many instances. So for example, I will compress, my third plugin is usually the Magic Death Eye, as I already explained, and I compress with a very mu plugin, um, and a very mu compressor type. And then I often compress through saturations, because saturators compress, right? So when I saturate a vocal, it is, it is reducing the dynamic range a little bit, and the transient response is, is getting lower. Um, and then I add a final compressor as well. And then from there, I do automation. So, and each one, in the first one, I'm doing maybe 2 dBs of gain reduction. Again, for the Magic Death Eye, it's mostly tone. And then saturation, again, is mostly tone. And then the 1176, I'm really only doing two, 1 to 3 dBs max. Like, and if I'm doing more, then I'm using the, mixed, the wet dry knob and blending it. And that gets me enough, minimizes the dynamic range enough where... Um, it saves me a lot of time from the automation, but as well as uh, it gives me that natural tone. You're going to find your own vibes. Just make sure that you do it all on purpose. I think that that's very, very important. Try out a different bunch of compressors, usually for vocals, uh, opto, FET, and uh, tube or very mu is our very common type compressors. Um, I think our comp and our Vox is very underrated from Waves. Um, but you're going to do your own thing, do your own sound, make your own sound, discover what you like. And yeah, so on that note, I think that that, that kind of covers everything. Um, let's get a quick shout out. If you like, if you have kids and you want to read them a book, I have, I write books. I write children's books. And, and I know that this is a music podcast and this is really random for me to be pitching music books, but I write books. Yeah. Go to links.dkmixes.com, scroll all the way to the bottom, check out my books. They're for free. They're free. I have digital copies that I give away for free. I, all the words in the books are actually lyrics to a song. I have two books out, out right now in English. I have one that's out in Japanese only. And, um, and uh, both of them, you can. there's a QR code on the front page. You can play the song for your kids and read it for them. And there's a spoken word audio book for it. It's, it's just like 25 page book. You can read it for free. Or if you want to purchase it, you can go on Amazon, search in DK and Kayoko. Kayoko is my wife's name. K-A-Y-O-K. K-A-Y-O-K-O. DK and Kayoko.com is also our website for that. Check that out if you'd like to. Um, also, mixingmusicpodcast.com. There's a whole sponsor list. Thank you to File Pass for to Loudon Audio for AutoTune, for Spreaker, uh, for all these different companies for various different needs. Go check it out, mixingmusicpodcast.com. If you check out that website, I also have a book list on there for a bunch of books that I recommend. Um, I have an equipment list that goes to Amazon. It shows you all the equipment that I recommend, potentially recommend using. And if you use any of these links or, and purchase anything from these links, we get a little bit of a kick cap, kickback. So we appreciate any of your help and your support. Even if you use those Amazon links and you don't buy anything that we recommend, for, if you buy something within 24 hours after clicking on our link, we get a little kickback. So it's a, it's a free way of giving us uh, supporting the channel without, without paying any sort of extra money. So we appreciate your help. Um, on that note, happy mixing, my friends. Get good vocals and stay saucy. One, two, three. Yeah.